hey everyone welcome welcome back to the channel this is Carmina Adelina and I know it's been a while since I last spoke to you via YouTube video but uh, I've been in the background doing readings doing classes and uh, today I'm back with a video about a very highly covered case in the past two three weeks and that's the case of the disappearance, which turned to homicide, of Gabby Petito. So, I wanted to wait a little bit before I made this video. I didn't necessarily care about uh, doing it fast and breaking some sort of story, astrological story. But I wanted to take time and actually think about why this is so interesting why so many people are captured by this story on a collective level so of course we're going to be looking at the astrology of gabby and brian we're going to make some observations there too but i think it's more important to realize why so many people have been captured by this story and Maybe there's something in our lives that we can change. And I'm just going to start right off the bat making a pretty easy prediction. Because as you know, there are a bunch of planets that are retrograde at the moment. There's Mercury, there's Saturn, there's Uranus, a whole bunch of planet, planets that are retrograde. So once these planets go direct, I think they're going to find him. I think the case is going to become more clear. And that's, I think, around the 18th of October. But as all these planets are currently retrograde, the information is being combed through, it's being revised, like things are, are being uh, revisited. And um, I think when all the planets, including Jupiter, which is divine justice go retro the go direct after october 18th we're gonna find some clarity with this case we're probably gonna find the fugitive brian let's look at the charts so here we have the synastry of brian and gabby of course we don't have their birth times we only have the date of their birth so brian laundry is the 18th of november and we don't know the birth time so we don't know the ascendant just ignore this lg which would normally be the ascendant we don't know the house cusp so right off the bat here i see that um, they have a sun it's not really conjunct because it's pretty far but it's in the same sign so sun as mars his sun is in the same sign as her mars so i can see these people have a pretty fiery intense love-hate relationship and uh, the constructive way in um, synastry in compatibility to deal with sun mars aspect would be to do a lot of uh, sports together do a lot of competitive activities together and always make sure there's fair play involved so that's one way of channeling that sun mars fiery energy or they could be working with fire together they could be working with lasers or sharp objects they can be cooking together so these are some ways to channel that fire in a constructive way that's not arguments of course their plutos are in the same sign because they are born within a year distance i believe a two years distance so pluto moves very slowly uh, another thing is that his mercury is on her pluto so his communication style is triggering her pluto and her pluto is triggering his mercury which is the way you uh, manage your life and the way you communicate so that's also not easy you have to be careful how you word the things that you say to each other. Of course, whenever we look at the compatibility, whenever we look at synastry, we have to check the individual charts first because one person can have more abusive tendencies and the other person can have more 
victim tendency. So not all the people who have Mercury in one chart uh, being close to Pluto in the other chart are going to end up in this situation. This is an extreme case fired up by personal circumstances, by also the transits that were happening didn't help. Brian also has a Mars-Venus conjunction in his chart. This is a very passionate energy, so he needs to channel it in something constructive. And then we have his south node is in the same sign as her sun and Mercury. So I think these are people that have met in a past life. Whenever I see south node connected to a planet, in the other person's chart, I always think past life connection. They were in a person of authority relationship, in a manager, I would say, because it's Sun and Mercury. Um, there, there was like a, a manager manage kind of relationship, like a boss-employee type of relationship. And I think Gabby was the boss in that past life because it's her Sun and her Mercury conjunct his South Node. Brian Saturn is on her Jupiter. For young people, that's quite difficult because her Jupiter, her joy is constricted by his Saturn. Like he was kind of disciplining, censoring her. You have to do things like this. You can't do things like this. This can be a good aspect when you're more mature. Let's say when you're past like 36, which is Saturn maturation. And you see this as more like a philosophical combination. Like you can discipline your ideas in a way and you can channel your ideas in a way. But they were both young in their early 20s. For young people, Mercury, Pluto, like these are difficult combinations to handle at such a young age. I remember that when her body was found, there was a full moon in Pisces. So the full moon was on her sun, on Gabby's uh, natal sun, and was close to Brian's south node. So that was also a big reveal when, after she had been missing for two weeks. So of course, in hindsight, it's easy to speak. It's easy to, to look at charts, but that's what we do. We try to learn, we try to see these astrological signs, we try to read them and make sense of them and learn something, learn a life lesson from them. Uh, why I think this case is so fascinating, it's because so many people can relate. Some people relate by having lost a loved one in similar circumstances, by going missing, but most people relate to this case because they are in a similar situation as Gabby. So I mean they are in a toxic relationship. They're either in a toxic relationship with another person, with their significant other, with their boss, with their family, a member of their family can have a toxic relationship with them, or they are in a toxic relationship with authority in general, with the government, with uh, some bad habit with an addiction. So there are many, many scenarios where we can have toxic, addictive, destructive uh, relationships in life. We can have these difficult patterns of behavior that we inherit from our parents or somehow we end up being uh, imprisoned by. It's difficult. It's difficult to get rid of them. This is a tragic case where we can see the concrete result of the toxic relationship. We can see a young 22-year-old girl who had so much life in her, her life being cut short, and this impacted many families. The thing with toxic relationships, it's easy to talk about them in theory. It's like, yeah, it's toxic. We know it's toxic. We know it's bad. but the thing is, it's difficult to break away from it. It's exactly, you can't live with it, you can live without it type of situation because the person becomes dependent, like the Stockholm Syndrome, on the aggressor, on the pain. So if you're in a toxic relationship with one of your parents, 
you still love them because they're your parents and you kind of get used to that bad behavior they're imposing on you. Your spouse, the same thing. Like you love that person and sometimes that person treats you really bad, but then you kind of get used to it. You say, well, maybe it's going to get better, etc., etc. I'm sure like the mind finds a lot of excuses, a lot of things to justify, to cling on to that bad pattern because the mind thinks, okay, if that toxic person is gone from my life, if that addiction is gone from my life, if that bad behavior is gone from my life, then I'm going to be left empty with nothing. Like, what am I going to fill my life with? So it's a little bit of codependency there with like um, something destructive. And you see, it's not good for you, but you know, what else is there if you get rid of it? So that's what happens psychologically. You develop affection you learn to live with the affection with your aggressor or with your self-destructive behavior or with your addiction. You're being used to living in pain. Like people say, oh, Gabby, she looks so happy in the pictures. I'm sure, of course, we all have moments when we're happy, but I also see from those pictures on her social media, her eyes are puffy from crying. There is a pain behind that smile. Another thing to learn from Gabby's experience, tragic experience, is that stop succumbing to social media's expectations of how you should be, like the pressure that you should be happy all the time. She thought that in order to be successful on social media, she always had to present a smile. Trying to live more authentically, and authentically means being uh, honest with what you really feel deep down, even if you uh, think it's not marketable or commercial. She was lying to herself and to other people by presenting this happy couple embarking on a travel. But when we hear from friends, from their testimonials, we know that they were not so happy and they had like a big argument where she had to leave the house where they lived together almost each month so it was already sensitive it was already bad a lot of women that i know my friends my clients and myself included have been at some point in their lives in a relationship that had a certain degree of abuse so it could have been only emotional abuse which is also very taxing but it could have also been physical abuse so when you get into that circle of abuse, you can't believe that it's happening to you. You try to brush it off, you try to dust it under the rug. Uh, you feel that maybe you did something wrong, so you are trying to take all the blame. So it's a perfect relationship between a person who is the abuser and the person who has, at that moment in life, lower self-esteem and is the perfect victim trying to take on the blame. It's difficult to rationally really explain how it works. Why do people stay so long in these type of abusive relationships? But the fact is that they do. And it has a lot to do with the person's psychology. Your own low self-esteem, the fear of being abandoned, like you don't know what's going to happen after. You think I've invested so much time in this relationship, I have to make it work. And the person actually finds it more desirable to keep that stability, even if it's like a painful stability, rather than cutting it off and trying to do something else. So if there is one thing you take from this Gabby Petito case, uh, this Gabby Petito tragedy is that you need to push yourself out of a bad situation. You need to push yourself out of a bad relationship, a bad habit now. Today is the day. Tomorrow may be too late. Okay, I'll be seeing you for more videos when the time is ripe. And until then, you can find me on my website, carmina amzacom for readings, for classes, and everything else. And see you soon. Bye.